The Guardians' goal at minimum this weekend was to split the series with the Orioles and earn the tiebreaker for the season. Does it matter how they got there? You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. The show is brought to you today by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use the code all lowercase locked on MLB for first deposit match up to $100. Today's show, the Guardians split the series with Baltimore. We're going to talk about if that matter, how they got there. If it matters, we'll talk about a little bit of Sunday's loss. We'll talk a little about Saturday. We're going to really focus in on the Guardians' pitching decisions over the weekend what pitching plans they have for the upcoming week. We'll also talk a little bit about the Hall of Fame induction ceremony over the weekend as well, and just some general very weird AL Central stuff. It was a weird weekend. It's been a weird season. Just, it's weird. Everything's been weird. I want to thank you all for joining us. For those who are curious, four was for the Grand Slam that uh, Travis Bazzana hit on uh, in the last we had this show. Uh, for those who do not know me, who is speaking now, I'm Jeff Ellis. I've been here since the beginning of the Locked On MLB Network. Uh, for baseball, 12, you know, probably approaching 1,500 episodes of this show. Before that, I was a national uh, writer at Scout and 24-7, focused on prospects and the draft. And before that, I was your 15th favorite writer at any Cleveland sports blog that has or will exist. All right, 15. Curious to see what that is. A fun I'm one. Out of their coast. fun one. Should be a fun one. Okay. Stick around for Tuesday's show to figure that one out. I'm Justin Ladd. I've been covering the Guardians minor league system since 2007. I've been around at places like Guardians Baseball Insider, the News Herald, the Morning Journal, Prospects Live. And here, hey, shout out to the captain. Shout out to uh, Bryce, who I ran into uh, at the captain's game on Friday night when I was out there. He is uh, a fan engagement specialist there. Said that him and uh, some other people in the office listen to the show every morning together. So if you're listening to this, guys. Shout out to you. We appreciate that. Hopefully next year we can make that meetup work when Jeff makes his annual trek back to Ohio in 2025, hopefully to celebrate another great draft and Guardians season, Central Division title, something like that. World Series. Yeah, right. we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk World Series. Yeah, Team of Destiny, something like that. Um, okay, so Guardians end up, that was the goal this weekend, and at least this four-game series was if you split, the four game set, you had the tie break over Baltimore. And right now Cleveland still has the advantage in the best record in the American league. Still best record in baseball, actually. So yeah. that's still good. The Phillies are, are struggling. It's only one game, but you got two games up on Baltimore right now. You got two games up on the, um, in the loss column on, I'm sorry, two games up total on the Yankees as well for best record in the American league. So that was the goal, right? The goal was to split the series at the very bare minimum and take the they season did. seriously. Have a tiebreaker at the end of the day. I mean, again, doesn't does it really matter how you got there? Because I know everyone would would have maybe preferred to not lose two or four or not lose two in a row. But you know, the, the two games coming in were the most winnable. You had Thursday night, which was Ben Lively, and they they threw Trevor Richards for Baltimore. We know Richards is not great. It was a lefty. Lane Thomas was in the lineup. So, of course, that gave the Guardians an advantage. And they scored big early. And then Friday, they scored a bunch of runs, which was good. That was against um, Dean Kramer, who's been good, not great this year. And then, you know, on on Friday, you had Carrasco. And everyone was like, oh, you better win the Ben Lively in the – well, it was going to be the Tanner Bybee start Saturday. But everyone was worried about about losing the Carrasco start. And they won the Carrasco start because – they didn't ask Carrasco to do too much. He did just enough. And that usually, I feel like that usually happens with Carlos Carrasco. Like, I feel like every time someone's like, oh, this is his last start, or oh, they're going to lose that start. Like, remember the Blue Jays series a few weeks ago or, or last month? Everyone was worried about that, and he pitched great. Like, I feel like every time if someone's worried about losing the Carlos Carrasco start of a series, they end up winning it. And then, you know, they lose the last two. So, I don't know. It sure would have been nice to see, like, Gavin Williams pitch better. Um, it would have been great to to try to go for the win Saturday night because you had Corbin Burns coming Sunday. But I'm going to say I don't like that mentality. I'll, I'll share why in a second. But I don't like that mentality of of um, punting or trying to win Saturday and punt Sunday because of who's on the mound. I don't like that mentality. I'll tell you why in a second. But I think it's just fine the way they got about it this weekend. You got the two wins. 
That's all you needed. Anything else would have been gravy. Four game series are hard to win, and Baltimore's a good team. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I would have taken a split if you had told me before the series began, you're going to take two out of two. I'd been like, ideal, perfect. Yeah, that's what we need. We win the yearly series this way. Um, the doom and gloom of it, you know, it's like Baltimore's really good. You, you took two out of four. That's that's a win. That is a net win. Positive Jeff. You is took here. four out of seven for the year. Yeah, it's, you know, I saw a lot of people complaining more about the deadline and things like that. And it's just like, I, I don't get it right now. Like, it has been so fun of late. Like, it's been fun all year. There has been ups and downs. But then we had the fantastic draft. They added two interesting guys at the deadline. Like, this has not just been a team sitting on their hands doing nothing. Like, they've been trying to find ways to improve. They've been calling up their young guys. They're giving most of them opportunities to at least go out there and and get not a chance to play. I mean, look at poor Jose Tania. He went Tana, He went to Washington, who's playing like 35-year-olds over him, even though that team's terrible. Like, it, you know, Cleveland has played Schneeman this year. They've played Rokio. And, you know, Rokio actually had a decent weekend. Like, if I'm going to sit here and drag that guy through the mud, I, he got him base on most games, and the defense is, you know, metrically played well. Like, I, I think this was a good weekend. I, I'm going to say that. It was a good weekend. Yeah, would I have liked it to have been better? Absolutely. But it was still a good weekend. Yeah, I mean, you can always you can always do better, but it was it was enough. I think that was the – maybe that's just what the, the feeling is. Like, they did enough. They didn't do more. I, I just got, I kind of feel like people were – I shouldn't say people. I should say the vibe in general about how the weekend went was like Saturday, you know, you had Joey Cantillo who had a great first three innings. And then this is where I think it, it kind of got weird is people were kind of wondering about, there were some interesting decisions with the rotation and, and the bullpen over the weekend and how to kind of line up things because like Cade Smith was not available on Saturday uh, because he threw 12 pitches Thursday and 21 pitches Friday. Gaddis threw 10 Friday. He was available Saturday, I assume, but he didn't go. Yeah, I would have um, liked him in that high leverage situation. That's what you and I were texting about. Yeah, I mean, Saturday was, look, like the first thing is you put in Joey Cantillo for the fourth inning, and that was the third time through the order. Was it the fifth inning? I think it was the fifth inning. I think it was the fifth inning. You brought, yeah, him, out, right? you brought him out for the fifth after a good four. The, the game was tied after four innings. The first three innings were good. He was throwing strikes. All of his stuff looked good. Um, he just had the first, the first thing double, which he worked, walked, or he worked around that wasn't walking guys. The fourth inning they got to him. The game was tied two two. And then you brought him out for the first batter of the fifth inning because the first batter was a left-hander. And I think it was Jackson holiday and he got on and, and then they immediately went to Pedro Avila right after. And I was like, why would you, I, I, I very, I very much questioned. Yeah. I didn't love that. Why bring Cantillo out for the, for the fifth inning when the fourth inning was struggling for him. And I, I understand why, because maybe Friday with Carrasco not knowing, going deep, he wanted to get a little more. But I feel like that was a little bit greedy. And you went to, you know, you took him out at the first sign of trouble, which I also understand doing. But I also don't like bringing yeah. relievers into innings that aren't clean, especially a, a reliever like Pedro Avila. Pedro Avila is fine when you're losing. They weren't losing. It was 2-2, but you brought him in, A, because you need to length that part of the game, um, and B, because you – you didn't want to go to anybody at that anybody of leverage that early. I don't understand that. But I don't no, know but why you, you would bring him of all people. Why would you bring him of all people into a cl- inning that's not clean when you're tied? Uh, that was weird. I mean, okay, for Saturday, for Saturday, you should have had, you know, Barlow threw 23 pitches Friday, so he's probably out. Yeah. You should have had Heron available. You had Salmon who did pitch, um, and you did have Gaddis who threw 10 the other night. So I, I understand you had to balance who was available Saturday and who was available Sunday. Um, but people, I saw, I saw the argument that why did the Guardians punt, quote unquote, punt Saturday a losable game when you a winnable game when you were facing Corbin Burns Sunday? I don't think, I don't like this mentality of well, Corbin Burns is pitching on Sunday, we're going to lose, so let's let's just win Saturday and punt Sunday at all costs. I hate that because you want to know what? When you get to October, you can't do that. You have to be Corbin Burns in October, and they had a chance to be Corbin Burns. They they scored five <laughs> runs off him. They were they made it close. Um, that's a terrible mentality to take is to say, well, we're going to lose this pitcher. So let's just go off for Saturday's win. And let's just, you know, assume we're going to lose Sunday. No, you got to figure out how to put your best foot forward every day. I think there were a lot of guys who weren't available Saturday. And I don't like the idea of just conceding a loss to Corbin Burns. Cause he's good. Cause you can't do that in October. You have to beat him in October. If you're going to face him. there's no, there's no, you know, sort of winning today and, and punting tomorrow in October. 
Yeah, I think in that particular situation, like I'm okay sending out Cantillo. You're trying to get length and the first guy gets on. I That doesn't bother me. But that is probably going to be the highest leverage situation of the entire game. Like outside of, you know, because you already have the base runner on, you have the heart of the order as well. So in that situation, in my my humble opinion, that's you go, you get Gaddis. You get your best reliever. And because the leverage, the, the chance that that inning is going to shift the game or, you know, a chance that anything is going to shift the game in Baltimore's favor, the highest chance of that is in that inning with that setup in that situation, not to go get your long guy. And again, I know the bullpen as, as you know, it's been facing a whole year of, of kind of being, you know, relied on too hard, but like, that is the point you go, you get Gaddis and you get out of that situation because he's been so good this year. And then you worry about it later because he didn't even pitch. So then they ended up not even using him. And then you didn't use your high, your one high leverage reliever you had. Yeah. Tim Heron came in on Sunday. Barlow didn't pitch Sunday. He had a bad Friday. Kate Smith didn't pitch Sunday or Sunday. He didn't pitch Saturday or Sunday. He was out Saturday for sure. He didn't end up pitching Sunday. He didn't go to Gaddis on Sunday. He didn't need class a Saturday or Sunday. So, I mean, I understand, you know, best laid plans and all that, but it, I kind of felt like it was trying to over, over manage a little bit. You know what I mean? Like they didn't, they were trying too hard to plan for the future instead of playing for right now. I, I don't, but I also don't agree with just punting on Sunday either. Like I, I know, I Agreed. know why they do what they did Saturday, but I don't agree with punting Sunday just because you're facing Corbin Burns. Cause again, you got to beat him in the playoffs. That's a loser mentality to say, well, we're probably going to lose tomorrow. So let's try to win today. Like, no, the team doesn't think that. And you and professional athletes don't think that way. So you can't manage that way. And I don't think they were, but it was weird to see them not use anybody of more consequence Saturday. And then on Sunday, when things were still close, you still ran out Eli Morgan. You still ran out Connor Gillespie um, to reset for the coming week. But we will talk about why they are resetting for the coming week in a little bit. We'll also talk about, a little about the offense. We might get into a little bit of Gavin Williams, a star, but maybe not too much. I don't know. He was fine, but I don't need to get into too much there. Um, but we'll get into more pitching plans. We'll get into some offensive stuff as well. All coming up. It was a hot one over the weekend. I needed to stay hydrated all weekend. Um, best way to do that is talk is taking liquid IVs. The popsicle firecracker flavor summer hit. Great one. Uh, you got to stay hydrated. Electrolytes, central vitamins. The number one powdered hydration brand in America is liquid IV. Those baseball games over the weekend were hot. If you're still playing sports over the summer. Maybe you got um, some football training camp coming up as well. Maybe you're going to some other training camps around. As well, it's going to be hot out. Stay hydrated. Um, I talked about how I used liquid IV last summer to set up for my wedding, my wife, and had to tear down the next day too. So we had a lot of work ahead of us, uh, three days straight, truthfully. So we needed to stay hydrated to be able to have fun that weekend and, and get everything done we needed to get done. So tear, pour, live a little more. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. No more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with liquid IV. Get 20% off. Your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com, use code MLB at the checkout, and that's 20% off that first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. Guardians are going to host the Arizona Dimebacks this coming week. Uh, checking all the action all week long on your Sirius XM map, just search Guardians to find the home or away broadcast, actually, for that game. Speaking of the Dimebacks, we're going to get into whether or not this is a trap series, so stay tuned for that. Um, Jeff, the Guardians over the weekend, though, offensively, did surpass their 2023 home run total. So 2023, this team hit 100 and what was it, 23 home runs, 124 home runs last year. Yes. So they now have 126 on the year, thanks to... Jose's blast and Josh Naylor is on yeah, Sunday and on, and on hells. Yeah. On hells. How many home runs do you remember them hitting in 2022? I'm just curious, not 2023, but 2022. So yeah, you, uh, you asked me this off air and it's like, Oh, it's 124. And you're like, no, that was last year. So I, you know, it's interesting because I don't really remember being afraid of home runs, but I also know I was very excited when they had a Josh Bell because the DH gave them nothing that year. So I don't know. Let, let's let's kind of shoot the middle a little bit from where they are now and where they were then. And I, I'm going to say like 150. 
It's 127 in 2022. Oh, wow. So they still need one more. So they didn't break them. I'm sorry. that I got that wrong. They didn't break their 2022 record. They are one away. But they are going to you know, surpass both last two years in home runs. So a nice jump overall in home yeah. run totals. Big changes. Yeah, that's good. That's that is a that is enough to make you say that there is a significant change going on in terms of development or um, strategy or just the general game planning. And I think um, where it's a significant change, it's not just fluky, right? No, agreed. Yeah, that's um, the consistency of it for a lot of players. I think you know really kind of stands out for me with that. And yeah, I think it's you're looking at a team that there's a reason why they have had the improvement they've had. Um, it's not just like one or two guys having a career year. It's, it's not like Oakland where it's two dudes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lawrence Butler and, and front Rooker, One of those guys should have been guardians. Gavin Williams. Okay. On Sunday, um, you know, eight strikeouts. He looked like he was dominant at times. He threw more changeups than sliders. That was interesting. I think they just had to do a lot with the lefties in the lineup. Cause you had, Kowser, Santander, who's a switch hitter, Henderson, O'Hearn, Rutschman, who's a switch hitter, Mullins, and Holiday were all left-handed hitters. So he needed to change it more. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was okay. It wasn't great. But he said for the game that he was hoping to incorporate a slider more next time out. He feels better about where it's at right now because he really became a two pitch pitcher. He relied on the fastball and the curveball, and, and, and Baltimore figured that out. They had a couple of home runs on the curveball because they were sitting on it. Um, and then he just lost command at times. So it was just an inconsistent start, but um, stuff still looks good. I think, remember, Gavin Williams is still in the month of May right now. He is still, this is like, he's made, this is what his fifth start, I think. I said five or six. I, for some reason, I was thinking six, but maybe you're right at five. Um, Either way, he, at the he most, was, he is still kind of in the month of May compared to everybody else's. That was yeah, seven, and, start number seven. So he's still, in, he's still in the month of May. Yeah. And, you know, I'll stand by what I said on Twitter. Some people got mad at this, but, when you look at who was traded at this deadline, um, let's be very honest. The White Sox apparently had no interest in trading Eric Fetty to Cleveland. Like that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't in play at all. So when you're looking at the top pitchers that were traded, one is Zach Eflin. Zach Eflin this year has been very close in data to Ben Lively. Um, and he makes 18 million next year. So let's be honest, that was never going to happen. That's why Zach Eflin went for three C-level prospects. That's just the truth of it. That's why he was not, you know, Jackson Bomeister is the, the biggest guy in that group. Um, then yeah, there, there's Jack Flattery, but Detroit was reluctant to trade him in division. Teams are weird. Um, you know, teams need to be more like the Marlins and just take the best they could get wherever it came from. So there wasn't a lot of choices. And, you know, a year ago, Gavin Williams looked better than Jack Flattery. Right now, Flattery looks better. Both have had health concerns. We'll see how it goes, but there just weren't a lot of guys to go get pitching wise. Uh, you need Gavin Williams to step up. They need him to be a postseason starter and they, you know, need him to get back to where he's been. Um, and listen, it's hard for all of them because everything got kind of moved around and flipped around with, with Tanner's tightness. Yeah. Speaking of which, can, you know, congrats to Connor Gillespie who made his major league debut yeah. on Sunday. He got to Cleveland he was, at 1am. Do you know what Sunday, team drafted so. him? The Orioles. Yep. Yeah. Eighth round pick of the Orioles. He was yeah. a minor league rule five pick over the off season. Um, he will probably wind up being optioned down because Logan Allen's going to start Monday. Uh, Alex Cobb should start this week before we get into the pitching plans for this week, because it's an important week for Cleveland for two reasons. A, you've got Arizona coming in before the Minnesota series, which makes that interesting. And two, it's a double header on Friday in Minnesota. And obviously it's a, a big series with where the standings are, but Jeff's got a theory on the Alex Cobb trade before we I get got, into the pitching plans for the week. I got two, I got two theories, two, so theories. There's two, two theories here. One is the whole player to be named layer is kind of like that. Not only are you getting a prospect, but you're getting a roster spot when they cut down on the number of players. You could, uh, the minor league affiliates, you can only ho have so many players on the roster. If you are the giants, you know, yes, they bought, uh, Mark Kaneha, but they also added a few other minor league players. Uh, they also just had the draft. I didn't go look. I probably should have talk about their uh if they've done any undrafted free agents we still haven't talked about the guardians undrafted free agent yet there's been so much to talk about um but you have to add 20 guys so basically by making a player to be named trader later trade they can buy a month or two of that player being on cleveland's list it gives them more flexibility in their minors which you may not think matters but it it does teams like to have you know they don't like cutting guys um if these rules weren't in place they wouldn't do it and the other one is 
I looked online, MLB trade rumors, I will say disagrees with me, but I, looking at the official MLB.com webpage on a player to be named later, it says the player must not be on the 25 man roster and must be eligible to be traded at the moment of the trade. So that means again, can't be from the last draft class, but by that logic, there is a world where if San Francisco competes and is doing well, that, you know, it could be a Strzelecki, it could be a Morgan, it could be a somebody like that. If you're looking at the letter of the law, whereas if they implode, it could be a prospect. Maybe it's, or it's, you know, maybe it's someone like uh, Nick Miklojek or um, why am I blanking on the lefty? Uh, um, who was yeah, also hurt. Meziazic. Meziazic. Like, it could also be mm-hmm. a chance to evaluate both of those arms longer term and then take one of them. Because this is a team that is not looking to turn, uh, you know, burn it all down. So I think it's interesting in that regard. It could be uh, multiple layers to it. Um, but it could also be, you know, dependent, like, Hey, if we're closer, maybe they want the proven guy. If they're farther away, maybe they go and gives them a longer look at Missy Isaac and, and Mick Lejack who have been hurt. Yeah. And the question is to when they have to close the book on this, when six months, when, so they have six months. So it could be yes, tomorrow or it could be six months from now, which could also so save depends. a 40 man spot through, you know, the, the rule five. By, it could, Cause we'll have to talk about that. that. Yeah. So there's, We've got there's ways to leverage sure. Yeah, and we got pitching plans to talk about for the upcoming week for Arizona and Minnesota. So we'll get into that here coming up in just a moment. First, let's go over to prize picks. Let's look. Tomorrow is not a super busy day, but let's look at uh, hitter strikeouts. That's a fun one. They Kyle Schwarber at 1.5 tomorrow versus the Dodgers. You got Brandon Marsh at 1.5 versus the Dodgers. I got to tell you, they do not believe in Brandon Marsh tomorrow. So if we look over here at pitcher strikeouts, because Tyler Glass now is pitching. That is why they do not believe. Uh, he's got seven and a half strikeouts. I like the over for him. I like the more, I should say, on that. Um, the other side of things, uh, Andrew Haney versus Houston. They have four pitcher strikeouts. Again, I kind of like the more there. I, I like what he's been doing this year. Uh, th- those stand out for me. Now, if these look good to you, and I didn't even look at what they're, what what's the one they're giving us this this week? Every week they give you one that is just a hundred percent an automatic slam dunk win. So you want to go through and find that deal. But head to pri- uh, PrizePicks.com, download the app, use the code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, go to the app, download, go to the website, download the app, use the code Locked On MLB, all lowercase, all one word, for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's free money. Price picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Thank you all for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today. For your second listen of the day, please check out our friend Sully over at Lockdown MLB Podcast, providing daily national expertise and trademark humor to help you get ready for the MLB playoffs. That's coming up soon and the end of the dog days of summer. So prepare for the fall classic with Sully. He's got you covered every single day. On Lockdown MLB, available on YouTube, wherever you get podcasts, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day this week, Jeff has something interesting going on. So Logan Allen's back up on Monday. He'll start that game. I saw he was scratched on Sunday for Will Dion, so that made sense. Likely Connor Gillespie goes down to create that roster spot. You can hang on to Eli Morgan for the for the week in a bullpen spot. Um, Sam Henches is going to make another rehab appearance in Columbus or in the minors before he comes back. Ben Lively will go Tuesday, Wednesday as Carlos Carrasco, and the Guardians are off Thursday. Friday is where it gets interesting. So um, Gavin Williams pitched Sunday, so likely he's in line to pitch on Friday. Alex Cobb is going to join the team this week. I think he likely factors in Friday because he pitched on Saturday uh, down in Columbus, and he pitched fairly well. He had 12 swings and misses, I think, uh, six on the curveball, six on the splitter. He was starting with a 94, so that's good. So Friday is interesting. You're throwing – you know, arguably one of your best three options in Gavin Williams on a doubleheader for against the Twins. And you're throwing Alex Cobb right into the mix, right into the fire on Friday, maybe into the doubleheader. I don't know which which way they'll schedule that. Uh, this is just a guess, by the way, after we know the rotation through Wednesday. I'm guessing Friday, Saturday, Sunday here. But, you know, you could move Cobb on, into Friday, and that's, that's a good way to get an evaluation on your trade, right, if he goes right into the division race. Um, tentatively... Bobby's going to throw a bullpen this week of all is he's sounds like things are good. Um, as long as everything after the bullpen is good, he'll pitch over the weekend. And then Sunday looks like Ben lively. Um, so your pitching matchup is still pretty good for the weekend in Minnesota, which is important because this is uh four of your 13 games against them. You're five and zero against Minnesota. 
but this is four games. And right now the twins are back for so four games right now, four and a half, they're four and a half back. So half we'll see what happens yeah. during the week, but going into Minnesota Friday, um, it's a big series for sure. But I think that's an interesting way to lay out your pitching. Yeah. And I mean, so far they've dominated the twins. Let's, let's be honest about it. I mean, I, I don't expect it to continue on because twins are a good team. Um, you know, just looking at who you're lining up to throw out there, it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting week. I think, I think Arizona is, is absolutely deadly. They're one of the hottest teams in baseball and you're getting Zach Gallen on Monday. I want to talk about, you know, I, I know you're like, Oh, you don't punt any games, but man, that, uh, Zach Allen versus Logan Allen feels a little bit like a, like a punt. Uh, that's, that's not an ideal matchup on either side, but you know, they, they've done a, listen, they've been beating good teams all year. They've beat good pitching all year. Um, it's a tough game, but they put up five on burns. This team finds ways to win. They find ways to battle and I'm not going to write them off just because it's a tough matchup. Right. Exactly. And everyone's ready to go. Like, yeah, you have Logan Allen going Monday, I wonder if that was part of the calculus with the bullpen decisions because, um, you know, you also might need some options available behind him on Monday to win the game because, you know, Logan Allen wasn't that great the last time he was up here. And he no. has not been fantastic in AAA. It's been okay, not great. So you wonder if maybe having, you know, Kate Smith and Barlow and Heron and Hunter Gaddis available for, for Monday, then that game – that could help you feel a little more good about lively on Tuesday. And then, you know, you have your options available Wednesday because you're off Thursday, which is great going into that weekend series. Plus everybody gets the 27th man in the weekend, but the Arizona series, I mean, that, t- that twin series is going to be really important, obviously for the standings, depending on how things look going in. And again, you want to go in and, and get a split, right? I think that's right now you're feeling like a four game series on the road where you're playing a double header against the team that's right next to you in the division standings. Like, like the Baltimore series, right? If, if we tell you right now that the goal is to split, no matter how they get there, that's that's the goal, right? Is to split that series in Minnesota? I agree. Yeah, that's that's you keep everything the same with the split. So, uh, yeah. So this Arizona you know, series, though, is like, you know, you hope it's not a trap series for them. And they, they've they been good about avoiding that all year. You know what I think is funny, though, is stat, for after Friday's win, they were a season high again. 25 games over 500. They have not been over 25 games over 500 this year. They were 25 over 500 when they beat Baltimore for the the third time, um, or I'm sorry, second time in three games out in Baltimore in June. And then they kind of went on a little bit of a spiral. Like I shouldn't say spiral. They, they struggled. They went to Kansas city and they had a rough series. Remember? And then they lost, um, they won two or three against the white Sox, but they kind of hit like a lull there uh, right after that. They were 25 games over 500 against Baltimore. And they did so on Friday of, of this series. And then they went out and lost two in a row. So I'm like, apparently they got 25 over when they face Baltimore. And then that's as far as they can get. And then everything starts to hit a wall. I don't know. So we'll see what happens in the Arizona series, but hopefully it's not a letdown. Hopefully they're, I know that Baltimore or that Minnesota series does loom large, but you know, you hope they're, they're focused on this week and there's just a lot up in New York pitching. So it's kind of a, a weird Welcome series. to baseball. Like every team, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Everybody's every team, got pitching, you know, junk that, right now. It's yeah, so bad. I, you know, I do want to shout out. I know we got one to make sure uh, at 8 chain 33 every day in the comments. Had a good point that Ben Lively has 10 wins this year. His career high before this year was four. Yeah. Uh, he's got eight total. I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, hopefully he'll, he'll be adding to that total and we'll get, get him up to 11 um, when, when this week is all said and done. Uh, you know, it's, Pitching is, it's mythical at this point. Like, it's just so hard to find, and everyone's struggling. <laughs> and the, uh, Baltimore's down, what, three, four guys? Like, it's it's crazy um, what a situation is for all of these teams. And in some respects, Cleveland's lucky where, you know, hopefully Allen and Mc, if, if, you know, Allen and McKenzie can figure out in the next few months, then they're, they, they got it to spare. And then that gives you some nice, you know, if Boyd doesn't work, if Cobb, takes longer we'll we'll have to see but and teams are hoarding pitching because it's hard to find it and if you want to have any intention of competing in the next two to three years why would you trade off a controlled arm yeah exactly uh tristan mckenzie did have 22 swings and misses on his saturday start in columbus that's really good he had 11 strikeouts and three walks in six innings his fastball velocity got to 96 
he was still, you know, 91, 93, whatever. So normal, but he got to 96. So I feel like the, the, it's not a health thing. Can't be a health thing. That was a great performance. Uh, the velocity was good. So I don't know what the next plan for him is. I think during the broadcast Sunday, they were saying they're not going to rush to call him back up. They want to make sure he builds off of this. Um, but there's a chance he could go with them to Minnesota. I don't know what their plan is. Here's the, here's the funny thing, too, is Cleveland's going to be in Minnesota over the weekend. Columbus will also be in St. Paul playing their series. So that gives you a really nice way to, to get guys taxed. I did not down realize that. To go to. Yeah, it, it lines up really well. So Cleveland's got a good chance to, to you know, you got your 27th man for the doubleheader. And then, you know, McKenzie might be out there with them just in case of a emergency. Who knows? But it's uh, it, it'll be interesting. CC Sabathia, speaking of high school pitchers, inducted into the Cleveland Hall of Fame over the weekend. That was a lot of fun. I was there Saturday. Um, a lot of fun. I mean, Johnny Goral also got in, which, by the way, over the years, Johnny Goral used to come out to Lake County a lot when I was there covering. And that guy just had the most interesting stories of baseball going back to the, the 40 or the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Just so much fun stuff. Uh, he's in. Cy Bunyak got in. But it was fun seeing Tommy there and Victor Martinez and Bayerga and Manny Ramirez. Andre Thornton was there. Charles Nagy. Always, always good. Uh to see all those guys at the ballpark brings back a lot of good memories. Um, you know, CC Sabathia was, was a, I feel like he was a, he was a fan favorite, but I think, I think he also caused a lot of frustration among fans when he was here. People were all, you know, he had a great 2001 season his rookie year, but was backed by one of the best offenses in baseball. And it took him a while to, to grow into the role of ace for Cleveland. And then won that Cy Young in 2007. I also thought it was interesting. He still thinks about it all these years later. He said, if I, had pitched better in 2007 in the playoffs, who would have won the World Series, which, you know, him and Carmona or Roberto Hernandez, if one of them had done better, then they probably would have because the World Series was essentially Cleveland and Boston that year. Yeah, it was that was unfortunate just with the way everything fell apart with just how terrible um, Colorado right was. at the end. Um, but yeah, no, I, I look, you know, I, the, the CC was just inter- interesting because he got up so quickly and then he kind of leveled off. And then he found like towards mm-hmm. the end of his run. I remember you and I had a big debate because it's like, and he signed an extension here. Like, you know, he did stay before he got traded and then you turned him in to Brantley and that, that worked out. Um, so yeah, he, he was interesting career arc in Cleveland. Yeah, for sure. But he had to grow into an ace. I mean, he came yeah. up as a 20 year old in 20 and 2001 and he had to grow into an ace, which is, which is not always easy. So there was um, a great like piece he, on the athletic. He, was it Zach, Zach's yeah, piece? From Zach. Yeah, he had a lot to, to grow yeah. up here, he said, which, fair. Think about all of us at age 20. I had a lot of growing up to do. I still have a lot of growing up to do. So who knows? And let's make a petition now. Next summer, Grady Sizemore needs to join that list next year. That's all I'm going to say. I, I mean, I'm sure there's others too, but Grady Sizemore next year has to Done. be on, on that list. Do it. Oh, agreed. Um Tomorrow's show, we'll talk about the Arizona series, Zach Allen versus Logan Allen. Got some minor league promotions coming up in the minor league. So Trent Denholm's going to Akron. So that's fun. Congratulations to him. We'll talk about that tomorrow a little bit as well, as long as some other guys that need to be promoted. Talk about some standouts and some fallers in the minors as well. And this week, I think we'll do a mailbag. So uh, start getting those questions in for the mailbag this week. I do not answer any questions, though. So it'll just be Justin while I sit here stone-faced. Uh, Fair enough. Th- all right. Give me all your questions. I may or may not respond. You may not like my response. <laughs> I'm just going to say yes or no. Thank you all for joining us, rating, reviewing, downloading. It helps. Thank you to all of our new listeners and all of our everydayers. And go, go, Guardians, go.